Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. I'm sure many of you have seen the story that has dominated the headlines these past few days, and that of course is the devastating wildfires that swept across the island of Maui in Hawaii. Just some incredibly tragic, uh, heartbreaking images coming out of Maui, including places like Lahaina, a good portion of which was completely leveled. Uh, over 90 people dead now and almost 2,000 buildings damaged or destroyed. But as with any extreme weather event, what we can do in the aftermath of these events is to try to decipher what caused them, uh, which helps us better prepare for these events in the future. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this video. We're going to take a look back at some of the meteorological factors that fueled these wildfires and took it from a fairly typical wildfire event to one of the deadliest wildfires in American history. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Before we dive into the Maui event, let's talk about some of the general factors that support critical fire weather conditions. We don't really talk about fire weather much at all on this channel because it's not nearly as nuanced as severe weather, and it's really a fairly simple collection of ingredients that has to come together in order to have enhanced fire weather conditions. The first thing you need is fuel, and that usually comes in the form of dried out vegetation. Grasses, plants, etc. need to be very, very dry, and usually that comes after a prolonged period of drought or lack of rainfall across a given region. The next thing you need is dry air throughout the atmosphere, and particularly in the low levels of the atmosphere. You want that air near the surface to be very, very dry, those surface relative humidities to be quite low, as that allows those fuels to continue to dry out, and of course moisture is the antithesis of fire. And the last thing you need is strong, gusty winds to help allow any fires that do start to spread very, very rapidly across the landscape. And when you have these three things in place, all you need is some sort of spark to get a fire going, such as a uh, lightning strike from a dry thunderstorm, a misplaced cigarette butt, a trailer dragging its chains on the road. So just something to get a spark to start out a fire uh, or multiple fires and then when you have these three things in place, those fires will spread very, very rapidly uh, and create a pretty significant fire weather event. All right, let's dive into the Maui event. Now, just for some context before we get into the meteorology, this is the island of Maui. Lahaina is on the very western tip of the island. And the Lahaina fire was not the only fire that firefighters were battling. There were also other significant fires in the central portion of the island. Now, these fires did most of their damage late Tuesday through Wednesday, August 9th. But there were brush fires that were ongoing early Tuesday morning, including one near Lahaina. Officials are unsure what initially caused these original brush fires, uh, but by about midday Tuesday, concern had subsided drastically. Uh, it was really a run-of-the-mill wildfire event that you might see anywhere in the United States. But of course, over the next 12 to 24 to 48 hours, things would change drastically and become one of the deadliest wildfire events in U.S. history. And it was those original brush fires from Tuesday morning that did eventually blossom into the deadly fires that we know now uh, to have consumed uh, all of these, this land area on the island of Maui. Let's start off with the latest drought monitor map from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, issued on Thursday, August 10th, so right at the height of this wildfire outbreak. This shows the current drought conditions for the islands of Hawaii, and the darker colors represent more significant drought. So Maui is right here, and as you can see, Maui is experiencing some of the worst drought conditions of all the Hawaiian islands, especially the central and western portions of the island, where moderate to severe drought has taken hold, and as, as we know, that's where the fires uh, did some of their worst damage. Now this drought has built in in a relatively short time span. If we were to go back two to two and a half months to the end of May, pretty much all of Hawaii was drought free. Uh, but a significant lack of rainfall through June and July allowed that drought to build back in, and that has helped to really dry out some of the plants and some of the highly flammable non-native grasses that are rampant across a lot of the abandoned sugarcane plantations uh, on the Hawaiian Islands, especially on Maui. Uh, and also, Maui saw a lot of rain early on in the year as well, which allowed these grasses to go, grow very efficiently, and then that was followed by this spring and summer dry snap uh, which dried them out. So you have a lot of grass that grew early in the year and that all of that grass became very dried out as this drought worsened going into the summer months. So there's plenty of fuel for significant wildfire activity across Hawaii, including the island of Maui. Next, let's take a look at some water vapor satellite imagery from late Tuesday into Wednesday. 
In particular, this is low level water vapor imagery. So this particular band penetrates into the lower levels of the atmosphere and shows us the moisture content of that low level air. The blues, greens, and whites indicate higher water vapor levels or more moist air. And the yellows, oranges, and reds indicate lower water vapor levels or dry air. So here are the Hawaiian Islands right in here. Here is Category 4 Hurricane Dora, which was moving well to the south of the Hawaiian Islands at this time. We're going to talk more about Hurricane Dora in just a minute. But take a look at all of this dry air from the west coast of the United States all the way out into the Central Pacific. These dark oranges and red colors indicate extremely dry air, pretty much enveloping the Hawaiian Islands, including Maui. So plenty of dry air throughout the atmosphere over Hawaii, helping to suppress any beneficial rainfall and continued to dry out those fuel sources that we talked about a minute ago. Now the big kicker that turned this from an ordinary event into one of the deadliest wildfire events in US history was the wind. Winds gusted up to 60, 70 miles per hour, possibly even higher from late Tuesday into Wednesday, which helped the ongoing brush fires from Tuesday rapidly spread and expand in size. To discuss why the winds were so significant, let's take a look at some data from the GFS model from 6Z on August 9th, so the late night run of the GFS on Tuesday evening. Yes, this is model data and not observed data, but this sector from the College of DuPage gives us the best broad scale view I could find of the background pattern surrounding the Central Pacific. And we're really only going to be looking at the uh, frames surrounding the initialization time. So it does give a pretty good depiction of what was going on at the time. So this map shows the surface pattern from Tuesday evening across the Pacific. Hawaii is located at the pink star right in here. The solid black contours are isobars or lines of equal pressure. And these barbs give us the wind speed and direction. And just as a quick refresher on the wind barbs, each full barb is 10 knots, each half barb is five knots. And the wind direction is determined by going through the, the barbs toward the center of the station. So this would be a 10 plus five, 15 knot wind for blowing from south to north. So this would be a 15 knot southerly wind. The first feature that jumps out at you is this massive area of very strong high pressure situated well to the north of the Hawaiian Islands. Very expansive, extending from the west coast of the United States all the way out to the east coast of Asia, and quite strong, as we said, 1,032 millibars at the center, which is quite a bit higher than a typical high pressure system you might see on the mainland here in the U.S. Now, along the equator to the south of the Hawaiian Islands, we have something called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ. And what happens along the ITCZ is air tends to converge or come together. And when air converges, that promotes low pressure. So often along the equator, we have an expansive area of low pressure near that ITCZ boundary. So we have strong high pressure to the north and low pressure to the south. That creates something that we call a pressure gradient. And a pressure gradient is simply a change in pressure over a certain distance. And the strength of the pressure gradient modulates the strength of the wind. When you have a stronger pressure gradient, you have stronger winds. So because we have very strong high pressure to the north of Hawaii and low pressure to the south, we have pressure that is changing significantly over a relatively short distance. Therefore, we have a very tight large scale or synoptic scale pressure gradient and in turn, very strong winds developed over the Central Pacific, including the area encompassing the Hawaiian Islands. And the way you can decipher a strong pressure gradient on a surface map is if you have your isobars packed very closely together, as we saw here in the Central Pacific on Tuesday evening into Wednesday. So for example, right in, in this area, you see the isobars are very, very close together. That indicates that the pressure is changing drastically over a very short distance. Therefore, you have a very strong pressure gradient and, and in turn, very strong winds. So, to summarize, very strong high pressure was situated to the north of Hawaii, transitioning to low pressure to the south. That created a very strong synoptic scale pressure gradient that allowed very strong easterly winds to develop, including the region in and around the Hawaiian Islands. Now there's been a lot of discussion about how much of an impact Hurricane Dora had in strengthening this pressure gradient and in turn strengthening the winds across Hawaii. Well, that's actually a bit of a misnomer. Now, as we just talked about, when you have a 
an area of high pressure transitioning to an area of low pressure over a short distance, you get a strong pressure gradient and in turn strong winds. So you might expect that when you add a strong hurricane into the mix, which of course is a center of strong low pressure, hurricane doors was about 950 millibars and falling, that we'd see a significant tightening of this pressure gradient and in turn much stronger winds. The problem was how small Dora was. We talked about how expansive this ridge of high pressure was, extending all the way from the west coast of the US all the way to the east coast of Asia. And of course this expansive area of low pressure here along the intertropical convergence zone. Those two features were very, very expansive, very large features. Dora was just too small to make much of a difference despite being a strong category four hurricane. We'll go to a, an advisory here from the NHC, National Hurricane Center, as Dora was passing to the south of Hawaii on Tuesday. This orange area represents the tropical storm force winds, the extent of the tropical storm force winds associated with Hurricane Dora. And you can see from this plot here that it's only, this was about 400 miles of difference between Hawaii and Dora. Uh, so this is probably about 80 to 100 miles or so across. So that's a very small storm, especially in relation to our aforementioned synoptic scale features. And I want to turn your attention to this tweet thread by Philippe Papin, who is a meteorologist at the National Hurricane Center. He used some mathematical techniques to actually remove Dora's vortex from the equation to quantify how much of an impact Dora had on increasing the low-level winds. And he found that Hurricane Dora did in fact increase the pressure gradient, but only very marginally. And when he actually removed Dora's vortex from the equation, it only changed the low-level winds by about three knots, or about three and a half miles per hour. So the bottom line is that the synoptic scale pressure gradient and its resultant surface winds were already extremely strong. And Hurricane Dora was just too small to have much of an impact in increasing the winds over Maui during this wildfire outbreak. There was also a topographical component that helped increase the already strong low-level winds over Maui. If we take a look back at our map of Maui with the fires overlaid, you'll see that they all occur on the western side of these two mountainous features that are situated on the island. This map shows it a little bit better. Here is Lahaina on the western slope of this mountain feature right here called the West Maui Mountains, which is an old volcano. We also have this other mountain feature right in here. Now we'll use this 3D side view of Maui to illustrate what's going on. We're looking basically due north at the island, and Lahaina is over here on the west side of this West Maui mountain range, and the mountains on the east side of the island are over in here. So our surface winds were pretty much due easterly, meaning that they were blowing from east to west. Well, when strong winds encounter significant terrain features like mountains, they can't go through the mountain, so they are forced upward on the side of the mountain that we call the windward side, the side that faces the prevailing wind. As that air rises, it cools and condenses and often forms clouds and storms. Well, that wind also goes up and over the mountains to the other side, which we call the leeward side. As that air descends, it accelerates due to gravity, and it also warms and dries out. These strong arid winds on the leeward side of the mountain are called downslope winds, or in scientific terms, catabatic winds. This is the exact same process that produces the hot, dry Santa Ana winds in Southern California, as well as the Chinook winds in the Pacific Northwest and in Canada. So in Maui's case, you had sort of a triple whammy on the western slopes of these mountain features as the already strong winds were forced up and over these mountains, and as they descended, they accelerated, becoming even stronger. And they also became hotter and drier, three things that wildfires love, and exacerbating an already dire situation. So that's gonna do it for this video. Hopefully you learned a few things about fire weather and just why this event on Maui turned from an ordinary brush fire event to one of the most deadly wildfire events in US history. It really was that perfect combination of ingredients that prolonged drought and dry air helping to really dry out those fuels, those highly flammable non-native grasses and plants. And it was that perfect storm between the background synoptic conditions and the topography on the island that helped really uh, enhance those winds across the island and allow those brush fires to spread rapidly and expand in size, catching a lot of people, unfortunately, off guard. Definitely keeping the people of Maui and all Hawaiians in our thoughts as we move forward and they try to rebuild from this devastating event and also keeping the 
families who lost loved ones in this event in mind. Uh, just an overall tragedy, overall very devastating event uh, that hopefully we at least can learn some things from and be better prepared in the future. But uh, it's going to take a lot of time for these folks to rebuild and hopefully they can return to some sense of normalcy in due time. If you're looking for a little bit more information on the overall progression of the event and some more information on the meteorological factors that played a role in this wildfire outbreak, this is a great Los Angeles Times article that I will link in the description box below so you can do some research on your own. But with that, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.